Good afternoon. Welcome. I, uh, I'm going to be your warm-up act, so uh, I invite you to uh, come on in and, get, and sit down. My name is Ed Bogan. I'm the Executive Director of Syracuse COE, uh, from New York State's Center of Excellence in Energy and Environmental Systems. I'm uh, pleased to welcome you to our uh, monthly research and technology forum. Uh, we've got our routine that some of you know on the uh, second Tuesdays. Um, and uh, so last, last month we weren't on second Tuesday because of a spring break at Syracuse University, but now we're back, back in the rhythm. And I encourage you to look at our schedule and uh, find, find other topics that are uh, of interest. Our, our next uh, forum is uh, second Tuesday in May, so that's May, May 14th. And, uh, and the uh, topic will be uh, green infrastructure. Uh, so I've got a couple of uh, just uh, announcements for, uh, for your information about ac activities uh, here at the, at the Center of Excellence. We're, we're going to have an event um, next Friday. We look, look forward to receiving a, a, a notice uh, where we will uh, celebrate uh, the awarding of uh, uh, the seventh round of our Commercialization Assistance uh, Program Awards. These are uh, uh, grants of up to $50,000 that go to companies to support uh, assistance with the commercialization of, uh, of new innovations. Uh, so 10 o'clock on April 19th, a week from, from Friday. Welcome uh, to come to that event. Um, on, the, on the table after our, uh, our program here, you'll see a, uh, a little handout about a program uh, that, uh, that we are offering in New York City on April 30th and May 1st as a part of uh, the Advanced Energy Conference at the, at the uh, Javits Center. It's a very uh, a broad program on uh, advanced energy technologies, drawing uh, uh, speakers from uh, across the country and around the world. We're offering a track specifically on uh, technologies for advanced buildings. I encourage you to take a look at, uh, at that opportunity. And then even looking, uh, looking to the fall, our annual symposium. Uh, we picked the dates. There's a save the date card out there, October 21st and 22nd. We look forward to that that event. Um, in uh, and I, I wel welcome uh, er everyone here. I want to give a special welcome to um, the, uh, the staff and the, and the students of the uh, Industrial Assessment Center. Uh, this is one of uh, so, so Rush, I need to be reminded 25, 26, 24. 24 of these centers funded by DOE at universities across the country. Uh, Syracuse University has had an industrial assessment center for, uh, I forget now, 2000. So since, 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 uh, since 2000, so for thir 13 years. It's led, led now by uh, Suresh Santanum. We have at least two students, how many students in the room? So students should raise their hands. So this is the, the next generation of energy efficiency. <laughs> We have companies that are here that hire engineers that know about energy, and here they are. So uh, we're, we're thrilled that uh, you're here and that we can make this, uh, this connection. Um, this program of uh, research and technology forums is, uh, is one of the activities uh, that is uh, brought, brought to the Center of Excellence through our partners. Uh, if your firm is not already a partner, another uh, uh, handout on the on the table in the back. At the, after, after we're done, you can pick up a brochure about the partner program. I want to recognize uh, Tammy Rosanio in the back, who uh, leads our uh, partner program activities. And if you have any questions about the partner program, please see Tammy. Um, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce the moderator of uh, today's program, Patrick Jackson. Patrick is a great uh, friend and supporter of uh, the Syracuse Center of Excellence, serves on our advisory board. Actually, in our, our partner program, we are launching an industry partners council, and, and Patrick will be chairing the, the industry partners council. Uh, Patrick has uh, led Corning's Global Energy Management Initiative since 2006. He's been with Corning since uh, 1989, and he's held positions in business operations and procurement management. Um, Patrick is uh, a member of the Association of Energy Engineers, Business Council of New York, serves on the Energy Committee, 
He served on the New York State Climate Action Council's Integration and Technical Panels. Uh, Patrick received the um, Energy Manager of the Year Award from the Association of Energy Engineers in 2007. He serves on the mul multiple boards. Um, Patrick has a bachelor's degree from a King's College and a master's in business administration from Syracuse University. Further ado, Patrick Jackson. I got the easy part. I just get to introduce these guys. <laughs> so, it's a nice summer day here in upstate New York. Something, something we're used to every single day, right? <laughs> Global warming. So we've got an interesting uh, program this afternoon for everybody. So um, I, I think hopefully somebody will walk away with one thing to take back to their organization. You know, if you get more than one, that's a bonus. But we'd like you to just pick up one item, take that back, use it, steal it, and pass it on to somebody else. So we're not in it alone. Um, today we've got three great panelists. So we're going to start out. Uh, Mike McCormick is with um, Burroughs Paper, which is in Little Falls, just down the road here. Uh, it's a close commute. He, he came by car, didn't fly. He has good greenhouse gas management. Um, after that, Scott Ryan with Corning is going to talk about the program that we work with. And then Bat and Cleanup over there, my good friend John Lawyer with Metney. But John's kind of key to this. John's going to tell you where to go to get the money to do your energy efficiency projects. So, you know. There's something for everyone here, okay? So let me introduce Mike. Uh, so, and then he's gonna talk a little bit about his company. What I failed to mention is when we get all done, there's gonna be uh, a panel discussion here. So write down any questions you've got. Uh, if you can hold the questions, unless they're clarification questions at the end, that would be great, okay? So let's start with uh, Mike. Uh, Mike's a licensed uh, PE in New York State. He's also a certified energy manager and hopefully he'll tell you a little bit about what that is. Um, he's been uh, in this role uh, at Burroughs for over 10 years. His, his role also includes procurement. So he's also, he works on reducing energy, but also how they source energy the most effective. And I think that's both electricity and natural gas. Um, I, I don't want anybody to throw him out, but he graduated from Notre Dame. Um, but then he went on to Clarkson, so they're, they're good friends of ours. So, um, he's also on the board of directors of multiple interveners. Um, he's worked in the nuclear power industry, owned his own business, and has worked for a tier one automotive uh, components supplier. So, would you help me welcome Michael? facilities here in the United States, two in Ohio, one in Iowa, a fourth one in Reno. Uh, we also have a uh, converting facility in, the, in Kirkrata in the Netherlands, and uh, the last one, a more recent uh, venture in, uh, in China. Uh, Hassan is uh, pretty close to uh, Macau and Hong Kong. It's within 100 miles of there, so it's, it's near the coast. Area. <clears throat> um, a little bit about, so that brings me into what Burroughs does. 
we are a specialty paper maker. And the reason is probably some of you have heard of Burroughs and a lot of you have never heard of Burroughs. Historically, we sort of flew under the radar. And one of the main reasons for that is we don't sell anything um, to the public. Uh, everything that we make goes to another uh, company to so how I say that is, um, well, I'll, I'll get into it a little bit further. So we make primarily food grade papers, primarily lightweight papers, uh, with a few other specialties in between. Um, so when you see a moisture and grease resistant wraps for burgers, fries, french fries, and tortillas, well, our biggest single customer is McDonald's. So we, uh, in the United States, Canada, and in Europe, and also in China as well. So every time you buy a burger, um, that wrap was made by us, the paper was made by us, and then it was printed and wax sheeted, stacked up, and sent to the purchasing arm of McDonald's and distributed around the country. So that also partly explains why you don't see uh, our name on it. Um, we also make uh, clamshell boxes. Um, we don't do any polystyrene or any plastics. They're all paper-based. Um, and we also make, it's not a big seller yet, but one called uh, an echo food box, which is 100% um, compostable. And my understanding is it's the only um, certified compostable uh, clamshell out on the market. Now, some places in the Northwest, in particular Oregon and um, Seattle areas, um, they have some uh, uh, regulations that require this, but most places don't, but that's what we do. Uh, other food grade papers, we make coffee filter. We're one of two or three companies in the country that make coffee filter, so uh, whether it's a bun brand or something else, chances are a um, good chance that we made the coffee filter paper. We don't do the converting of it, but again. And then we also, oh, pear wrap is an interesting one. We make this in uh, Mississippi uh, at our one paper, got a paper mill in Mississippi. Uh, this is the paper that is green in color. You see it wrapped around apples, pears, and other fruits. And there's a reason it's green, and that's because it has copper sulfate in it as well as some other uh, fungicides. So it actually does help preserve um, because uh, it's treated and made to specifically, specifically for that purpose. Other things that we make, um, occasionally we'll make gift wrap tissue. We used to do a lot of it, but it all went to China. But, um, but we still make a little bit on occasion. We made some oddball things, uh, uh, tissue like you would wrap shirts and things in. Um, we did a trial once that was a camouflage we do all kinds of oddball specialty things. So it actually had different pigments in it. They were sort of like dropped in uh, as we were making the sheet. So it was camouflage and color. We make uh, archival paper, the kind that uh, interleaving in books for pictures and uh, that uh, main file mainly in books. Battery paper is one that um, um, nobody ever sees anything about because we make paper for um, Johnson Controls. And they're the largest automotive car battery maker in the United States. And as they make the lead acid batteries, they use our paper to uh, separate the, uh, the layers of lead. And then after they make the battery and put the sulfuric acid in the paper, it disappears. Uh, pattern paper, we make uh, pattern paper for um, the halls and the Patterns of wires. And OTC just stands for one time carbonizing. That used to be a big grade. That was when, when originally you'd have uh, forms with three or four layers of carbon paper. And we used to do carbon paper too. And then they went, uh, we used to make that carbon paper. Then they went to where we didn't need the carbon paper and now we don't use it at all. But, uh, but occasionally somebody still wants something. <coughs> Uh, we make other specialty grades called Dr. Roll, uh, the rolls that you have on the examination tables. Uh, we make a lot of that. So all these oddball things.
things that never knew where they came from and never cared. But uh, we make a lot of those things. So that's sort of why we, how we sort of flew under the radar. Now, Burroughs has had sort of an interesting <coughs> philosophy over the years in that uh, Bill, it's a privately owned company, and Bill Burroughs is our, our chairman and CEO. His philosophy has always been that he wanted to be energy independent. He wanted to generate as much electricity um, as we consume. And his thought was that uh, energy prices tended to be volatile, and if he generated power, then no matter what happened with energy supply prices, we could hedge against um, that cost uh, by <coughs> generating our own power. Now, it's a little bit, you know, every company is different. Burroughs tends to be located, uh, the three original paper mills are in central New York. Two of them are on rivers, one of them's on the Mohawk River, the other one, another one is on the Moose River, which uh, anybody who likes the Adirondack, the Moose River drains the Fulton Chain of Lakes, it goes up through Old Fortune. So, just for your information then, the Moose River comes down out of there and then goes north and joins the Black River in Lyons Falls and eventually goes into the St. Lawrence up in the Clayton area. So, related to that, Bill loved hydro. Um, we have tended to, uh, we have two hydro facilities, one three megawatt and another, thir another 13 megawatt. And in our New York paper mills, uh, we don't actually consume the electricity directly. Uh, we sell it to the grid, um, but we could do it if we wanted to. Um, but Bill has always been interested in sustainable and carbon neutral generation. So, you know, we put uh, solar photovoltaic generation on our headquarters. Um, you know, 40 kW doesn't generate enough power to say so, but um, it doesn't hurt either. Uh, and the, the incentives were there, so it, it made sense. Um, but we also, aside from trying to buy other hydro plants, we have tried, uh, it didn't work out, but uh, we're always on the lookout for other hydro plants. Um, we have gotten into, we, we were interested in a biomass uh, electric generation plant. Um, didn't work out one of these times. I've got a, I'll get into it a little more a little bit later, but we've gotten grants from the federal government for um, biomass boilers to, uh, to help build those. Uh, in this particular instance, we turned it down, but we got the grant for that. <coughs> so we go out of our way to find the, find the um, incentives and uh, funding that's out there. And, and that's important for everybody in this day and age. So, oh, what I didn't really say yet, but another thing we've always been looking at is, uh, uh, anybody familiar with Syngas? Well, you know, we used to have, as a backup fuel, we used to burn number two and number six oil. Well, we never really liked them. And we gave those permits up. We don't burn any oil anymore. Um, but we've been very interested because of our location. One of the facilities is pretty much it's within a quarter of a mile of the Adirondack uh, Park. Um, there's a lot of wood around, but uh, we are would love to at some point in time uh, <coughs> generate syn gas from wood chips. Uh, and use that as a replacement, as a backup fuel for natural gas. It doesn't have quite the BTU value, excuse me, and it requires a little bit more scrubbing, but it could be a suitable substitute for natural gas. And uh, most people forget about that, um, and they don't have gas, they burn oil, but there are other alternatives, and, uh, and when you're making sim gas, um, it's also um, carbon neutral because it's uh, you're making it from chips. So the other part about becoming energy independent, aside from making your own power, is to reducing the energy <coughs> that you use. So like everybody else, 
We try to do that. Um, in the past eight years, we've reduced our unit energy consumption by 25%, and we can do it another 25% in the next eight years. The first 25% is pretty easy. Uh, in reality, with uh, it's more equipment needed to get to the the next 25%. It's a little trickier because it really involves more of the way of training of employees, and there's always always a resistance to doing things uh, newer. But but it's certainly doable. So <clears throat> this is an actual chart that I do that shows our energy consumption. These numbers on the bottom here are um, MMBTUs per ton of short tons of paper produced. Um, and you, what noticeably sticks out right off the bat is this, this green line here that's way above everything else. There were reasons for that. Um, um, it was one paper mill that had two paper machines. It was quite inefficient. Um, but also the paper that we made turned out uh, was a very uh, off off grade. Uh, we shut one machine down. But the reality still is that um, since 2003, um, we have reduced our unit consumption by 24, 25%. And you see at the end over here, this appears to be up well. That doesn't really tell you much because that's only taking into account the first quarter of the year. And as you'll see on the next slide, all of these peaks here, those are all first quarters. And that's part of the seasonality of it. When you're heating your buildings, um, you use more energy and there's uh, not much way around it. Now, the, the way to get around that uh, going forward is more and more heat recovery and particularly uh, in the paper making business you use quite a bit of heat and there's quite a bit of opportunity for heat recovery. Not all industries are like that, all, not all businesses are like that. But the good news is that over here on the far right, the first quarter of this year um, is the most efficient first quarter we've ever had. So compare that to last year when we had a record warm winter, um, we're doing something right. I haven't exactly analyzed it to figure out what we did right, but we're doing it anyway. So this is just a chart that actually is the data for, uh, we, in this case here, it's kilowatt hours per ton and decatherms per ton, and we just combine them together, uh, convert kilowatt hours to uh, MMBTUs, and just call it something different, but anyway, it's the combined thing, combined number. So the other thing related to this is carbon footprint. And everybody we sell paper to, McDonald's being first on the list, they want us to reduce our carbon footprint. Well, we try to tell them, well, what's it worth to you? Well, it's not worth anything. <laughs> they won't give us any extra money for it. But they still want us to do it. And, and we're in the, we have to go through a, a whole uh, audit related to that. Now, you'll notice that uh, this one here is way lower. Um, in that particular year, we bought a considerable amount of steam from a uh, neighbor across the road, uh, which, who is a, uh, a wood chip, uh, a wood chip burning power plant. So they, we bought quite a bit of steam from them. And since uh, the steam is carbon neutral, that uh, lowered the number quite a bit. Since that time, uh, they've had quite a bit of, uh, uh, they had some reliability problems and they haven't really gotten any steam. But we intend to buy more steam from them going forward. But, uh, so that particular year was way down. I don't know how far you can go. Um, obviously, there are some people who at some point in time will say, well, we are totally carbon neutral in the paper that we make. Some companies like Mohawk Papers, um, in the Cahos, the Albany area. Um, they invest in uh, renewable energy certificates. Uh, they, they buy them so that they can say that they're, uh, 
their electricity is uh, carbon neutral. Uh, we would do that if it was worth it. Now, if we need that to do that to get new business or to keep the business we have, we certainly would do it. Uh, but in the end, you know, one of the reasons that we do energy efficiency projects, aside from being the right thing to do, and aside from reducing our carbon footprint and um, and reducing the amount of energy that we spend, those are good enough all in its own. But the other part of it is they save us money. And the bottom line is most companies, uh, they want to do the right thing, but if, they, if it's going to cost them an arm and a leg to do it, it makes it a lot harder to do. Um, some of the projects, so this is what I really came to talk about. Um, and this is sort of the theme of my talk, and I didn't have one until I got to this slide. And, and every facility that we have, and I think every company is this way, um, everybody's a little bit different. We're blessed, I guess, that we, some of our paper mills are on rivers. We have an opportunity generate hydropower, a lot of people don't have that. Um, one of our mills is on the edge of the Adirondacks, we're close to, to woods. Uh, that, that is a benefit we hope to exploit it sometime. Every facility has some unique features, but then there's also commonalities. Um, and so what we really want to do in any company, any facility, is analyze what the needs of your facilities are and then try to figure out a way to exploit the strengths that you have, the natural resources that you may have available, or whether it's cheap electricity, or, uh, or water, or, or woods, or something else. Uh, one, the one mill that we have here, I, I misspoke here, it's a 13 megawatt hydro generation. It's located on the, on the Erie Canal, on the Mohawk River, um, and it generates the good chunk of our electricity. Uh, another mill has the three megawatt hydro generation, but it's located on the ed edge of the Adirondacks. And we would love to put in a biomass boiler, and I had a, I got a, received a grant for that, we just didn't get to it or do it yet. Or do syngas generation so that we didn't have to burn uh, natural <coughs> gas. Um, the other, another interesting one, um, when I say mill D there, <coughs> in our paper mill in Mississippi, we use well water for our process. And that well water is 85 degrees coming out of the ground year round. Um, we don't know why, but it's a fairly deep well, it's 1400 feet deep. So there has to be geothermal heating going on somewhere down there. So. I wrote a grant. This was back uh, right after the financial collapse, so I got the uh, m money was easy to come. Grant money was, I shouldn't say easy to come by, it's never easy to come by. But there was money available to, to put in a, a heating system that uh, used no, uh, no fossil fuels at all. We just used the water to heat the building. If you look at the paper machine as a, as a black box, uh, we've got water at 85 degrees coming out of the ground, and in the, in the black box of the paper machine, the pumps, um, steam being used, other things, warms the water up to around 100 degrees. And so we diverted that water um, just to use a clarifier or, or filter to get out all of the uh, fiber and other junk in it, and uh, send it to the uh, heat air handlers, and if you use six or eight row coils in the air handlers, you can uh, you can get heat out of them at approximately 15 degrees delta T at probably 15 degrees below the temperature of the water going in. And so uh, we have a few bugs still to work out of it, but it was a good idea and it uh, worked out pretty well. Uh, on this, we did most of the engineering in-house. And the other thing that it does is we have a cooling tower because we have a 90 degree limit on our discharge water. Um, so 
this saves a lot of our cooling tower. Uh, cooling towers don't have terribly big motors on them or fans on them, but if we don't have to run them, it still saves uh, 50 horsepower. And uh, 50 horsepower running 24-7 adds up. Uh, the other project that I want to talk about a little bit, and I couldn't put a slide on it. How am I doing my time? Good. This, later this year, we're putting an enclosed hood on one of our paper machines in Little Falls. Now, most, most new paper machines have enclosed hoods. Um, so it's not like a terrible new technology or anything else. But we're doing it because, one, it makes sense. Two, we expect to save 30 to 40, maybe even 50 percent of our gas consumption by putting this in closed hood. Uh, when you dry paper, you typically try to dry it down to around 5% moisture. That's considered bone dry. Um, we have some, when you have your canned dryers, these livable dryers that are you know, all over the place in the dryer section, um, they trap air in there hard to get that moist air. You're, you're heating dryer cans with steam, um, but then they steam, uh, the heat goes through the, the surface of the dryer, but then it gets trapped in amongst all of the fabrics and the felts and the, and the belts that carry the paper along in there. Um, so with the new dryer hood, oh, and the other thing that happens there is some of the air gets trapped, so parts, sections of the paper of the sheet as you go across it, some parts are dried to 5%, some are still 6 or 7 or 8%. And so as a result, you have to dry, in order to have all the paper at 5%, some of it gets dried down to 2%. Well, the uh, extra amount of energy that it takes to dry the paper down that extra couple of percent in spots adds up very quickly because it's harder to, it takes a lot more energy to get that last few percent out. But when they close the hood and things they call pocket ventilation, the sheet completely evenly from side to side and so that's the main reason that we can use a lot less energy because we're not going to over dry the sheet we're going to to dry it as much as it needs and it done with it. Um, and obviously with an enclosed hood um, you're keeping what heat you got in an enclosed area uh, and it's easier to deal with it. So we can do heat recovery on it for building heating. Um, just and that's a big deal as well because we would be anytime you can get rid of steam heaters or, or natural gas heaters in your production areas uh, in the wintertime uh, is a big deal in upstate New York. I can't, I couldn't show you any pictures, one we haven't built it yet, um, and I can't really talk about the why we're doing <coughs> it because it makes economic sense. But we're getting into a different market uh, for some paper and it's important that we do this. Um, and it will be a big boom to girls. So that's the end of my little talk. I hope it, hope it was interesting a little bit.